Thank you very much, Lyle. Thank you very much, Angela, for the generous words and that very touching uh, personal insight, which I wasn't even aware of. Uh, so it shows how deep this subject is and how sensitive the subject is and how difficult it is to tread the path between truth and love, between saying what must be said and s being kind. And I must say I was very touched to have one of the reviews of this book on Sunday was by James Parker, who lived as a homosexual man for 20 or 30 years. He reviewed it in the Catholic Weekly, and he said he always approaches any book on these subjects with great critical suspicion until he finds whether the author can find that balance between understanding the complexities of life for same-sex attracted people, the burden they bear, and clear presentation of why marriage has to be what it is in nature, a man-woman thing. And James Parker said, this author achieves that in spades. And I was glad he said that. And uh, uh, Senator Abetz, who launched it in Hobart, said it was masterful, which is high praise from such a tough mind. And Piers Ackerman said it was a compelling read. And a, a, a Queensland MP friend of mine said that it's a clarion call to the complacent. It's a wonderfully kind and persuasive read. So if you can get past the garish cover, I hope you'll like what's inside. Now, today's a very significant day because today is 100 days since the election. And if you remember, Mr Shorten said that were they to win the election, same-sex marriage would be legalised within 100 days. In large part due to the passion of some in marginal seats like Chisholm, the Greeks, the Chinese, who moved their rusted-on Labor vote across and give the Turnbull government power, their passion was about marriage and safe schools and safe schools and marriage and safe schools. So it would be important for the coalition going into the next election to maintain that vital difference that prevented more people drifting away from their base. But if on day 101, Mr Shorten does uh, veto the people's vote, that was the clearest promise, the clearest mandate going into the last election. If he vetoes it, so be it, he has poisoned the springs of the plebiscite with very unstatesmanlike talk of Anyone who opposes same-sex marriage is a hater crawling out from under a rock. Anyone who argues for gay marriage has essentially got blood on their hands because young LGBT people will suicide. It's an embarrassingly childish approach and the shades of Curtin and Chifley to think that this is now a Labour statesman. But we won't dwell on that. We'll say that if he does veto it tomorrow, then we have a longer campaign where every day counts because the task will be to fortify the coalition in affirming the necessary truth that no one has the authority, no government has the authority to redefine marriage because it is an institution that predates all government. Men and women have vowed themselves to each other and cared for their young long before there was any state, any law, any religion. It is an institution of nature. It is a natural nobility of our race. And government has no authority to redefine it. Nor do courts and, frankly, nor do plebiscites. But if we are foolish enough to contemplate redefining marriage and family, let it be on all of our heads. It must at least be the people themselves, not government, who make the call about the people's institution given by nature, not by government. But Angela alluded to the coercive element in this revolution of gender. And in fact, the first word in my book is coercion. It comes from a quote from everyone's favourite Marxist, Brendan O'Neill, where he says, coercion is built into gay marriage. They used to say love and marriage went together. With gay marriage, it's authoritarianism and marriage that are bedfellows. And he says elsewhere, 
there is a morally coercive streak to the gay marriage movement, which seems to desire not just tolerance of its ideas, but psychological acceptance and affirmation of them by everybody. To this end, says Brendan O'Neill, businesses run by individuals who are less than keen on gay marriage have found themselves boycotted against, protested against, demonised by Twitter mobs, end quote. It's very apt because just in the last couple of weeks, we've had, as I mentioned on the video, the boycott of our meeting in Sydney. 150 of the most respectable and frankly nicest people you'd ever meet not allowed to meet in a hotel in Sydney because the organised agitation from the gay lobby, death threats to the hotel, intimidation of staff, and finally the hotel had to say we just can't risk it. Now, I noticed that Lyle Shelton uh, didn't take it out on the hotel. He understood the situation. That's sad. We'll have to meet in secret. And we did. In a couple of days later, when a um, decree came from the printer for my publisher, for Connor Court, the day before the book launch, the day before we were launching in Brisbane, the printer sends a message to the publisher at 20 minutes to midnight saying, head office in Sydney says we're not going to print your book because of, quote, the subject matter and content, end quote. Pure ideological boycott. And now again, I didn't threaten to take them to the anti-discrimination board. That is unworthy of free people. They are a private company. They are free to boycott my book. It's sad because it's only a week after the government's tabled a bill for a national debate and one of the biggest printers in the country says we're not going to print a book from that side of the debate. It does chill our vigorous national discussion, but they are within their rights to do so. However, wouldn't it be nice if it went both ways? If some little family baker who really doesn't want to write a gay marriage slogan on a wedding cake, if, they don't, if, if, if the lesbian couple would only just go down the road to the other baker, but they, they don't. They don't. That's the coercive element that Brendan O'Neill refers to. Uh, the other coercive element is the moral coercion that I mentioned coming from the likes of Mr Di Natale in the Greens and Mr Shorten, which is to demonise anyone who simply wants to uphold the law of the land and the rights of children, to have where possible a mum and a dad. So that is the context in which this little book is launched, and it's conventional at book launches to read an excerpt. And I will do so from the introduction. But in the spirit of a campaign book, it's not called introduction, it's called the indictment. It has a three parts to it. That same-sex marriage is untrue, unjust and unnecessary. Untrue to nature and timeless culture. Unjust because it destines future children to a motherless or fatherless existence and unnecessary to achieve civil equality between citizens. So, lesbian social historian E.J. Graff writes that same-sex marriage is a breathtakingly subversive idea, end quote. But we, the public, are told that nothing will change. This book takes a hard look at the changes that will come with this subversive idea, how it redefines marriage and parenting and family for all of us, how it breaks a child's bonds of kinship and identity, how it usurps parental authority over their child's education, how it eats away at those core liberties of speech, of conscience, of religion, and how it serves that century-long ideological quest to deconstruct the natural family and subjugate it to the authority of the state. Those of us who once thought that marriage equality was just about marriage now realise we were wrong. For the serious LGBTQ activists, it is about capturing the legal high ground from where the entire rainbow agenda can be implemented. And this ranges from imposing radical safe schools gender theory on our children to passing laws that let cross-dressing males use girls' bathrooms, from bankrupting those bakers who don't want to write a gay marriage slogan on a cake, or silencing those pastors who dare teach traditional values on marriage and sexuality. It ranges from removing mother and father from birth certificates 
to changing husband and wife into partner A and B, as we have seen overseas. Worst of all, a law for same-sex marriage will force future children to miss out on either their mother or their father while telling them that it doesn't matter. Missing out not because of some tragedy in their life, which happens. The mother dies, the father deserts. They will miss out because of a premeditated act of parliament. So that injustice against the future child is the central offence of marriage equality. We are guilty of stealing, stealing a child's birthright when we institute motherless families and fatherless <coughs> homes as an ideal in our law. Why would we do that to a future child? Have we learnt nothing from past government policies that broke those bonds of blood and belonging? In 2013, our then Prime Minister, the Honourable Julia Gillard, gave that national apology for forced adoption of babies away from their teenage mothers. In a very moving speech, she confessed our shame for a policy that broke, quote, the most primal and sacred bond there is, the bond between a mother and her baby, end quote. So three years later, we are being asked to accept another policy that will break those primal and sacred bonds all over again. Because if we institute the marriage of two men, we are instituting motherless families. We are saying that future children don't need a mother. We are legislating to ensure they do not have a mother. So we are shallow fools. And which uh, future Prime Minister will have to give that heartfelt national apology to the motherless generation? So the bulk of this book deals with the multifaceted injustice that comes with marriage equality and with its ideological fellow travellers who comprise the wedding party. But there are two further charges that must be laid, that the proposition of same-sex marriage is untrue and it is unnecessary. Because marriage is founded on a truth of nature that only a man and woman can create a child, only a man and woman can give that child her mother and father, her biological identity, kinship and ancestry. That is nature's job description for marriage and family, and two men need not apply. Attempting to give marriage a different meaning, BFF, best friends forever, for any two romantically inclined adults is an adolescent prank, but it's not a harmless one. It tramples on truths of nature and culture, of kinship and creed, and it has consequences. Because marriage is not a social invention. It is a social recognition of pre-existing biological reality, male, female offspring. The great anthropologist Claude Lévy-Strauss described marriage as a social institution on a biological foundation, end quote. Now, all of our marriage laws and customs exist to reinforce that biological foundation, helping to keep a man with his mate for the sake of social stability, but above all for the sake of any child they might create. Now, not all marriages do create children, but typically they do, and institutions exist for typical cases. Marriages which do not create children are still fully marriages because they fulfil the two criteria of marriage. They bring together the two great halves of nature, male and female, in that conjugal union. And they can give a child, albeit an adopted child, the mother relationship and father relationship that a child needs. Now, same-sex couples obviously do not bring together the two great halves of nature in a conjugal union. They cannot give a child, any child, the mother and father relationship that a child needs. Such relationships matter greatly to the individuals involved, and they deserve neighbourly respect, but they are a different kind of thing 
to that great natural project of marriage and family. And they need to find a different word. This is not a theological argument. The great atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell said in his book Marriage and Morals, back in 1929, quote, it is through children alone that sexual relations become of importance to society and worthy to be taken cognizance of by a legal institution, end quote. Same-sex relationships don't create children, so society has no institutional interest in regulating such friendships. It's only because the man-woman pair bond typically results in children that every society has always needed to put that great effort into reinforcing that bond, striving to keep that feral by nature male with the mother of his babies. Because the only alternative is abandoned mothers, fatherless children, poverty and chaos. But you ask, hasn't marriage evolved through history? No, it has not in its essence. Go back as far as you can in written history and you will always find marriage as a man-woman thing, as the necessary and therefore universal basis of society. Levi Strauss surveys history and culture throughout the ages and concludes, quote, the family, based on a union more or less durable but socially approved of two individuals of opposite sexes who establish a household and bear and raise children, appears to be a practically universal phenomenon present in every type of society, end quote. And it's misleading to claim that marriage has evolved by citing historical cases of racism, where blacks couldn't marry whites, or polygamy, where a man could marry several women, because neither of those degraded social situations changed the essential fact that marriage was always and everywhere between man and woman. Racist laws existed to keep blacks and whites apart, and that also involved keeping men and women apart, but the banned marriages were a man-woman thing. Tribal laws might allow a man to have several wives, but each and every sexual relationship within that marriage was a man-woman thing. Never. Never was the male-female essence of marriage in question. But you seem to remember that there were homosexual marriages in history? Well, no, there were not, with one notable exception. Yes, homosexual relationships are recorded in history, even affirmed. But there's never been an institution of homosexual marriage because it could serve no useful purpose. As a rare aberration that proves the rule, the ancient Romans did record one case of official homosexual marriage in AD 64, but that was the Emperor Nero, whom the historian Tacitus described at the time as, quote, corrupted by every lust, natural and unnatural, end quote. Even Tacitus, historian of decadent Rome, had trouble concealing his disgust when he wrote, quote, the emperor in the presence of witnesses put on the bridal veil, dowry, marriage bed, wedding torches, all were there, Indeed, everything was public, which even in a natural union is veiled by night, end quote. Now, I haven't seen that historic gay wedding, that imperial affirmation that love is love, celebrated in any TV ads for marriage equality. The ancient Greeks indulged homosexual relations, but never confused that with the necessary life task of marriage and family. As early as Homer, we find the word gamos to describe the honoured relationship between man and woman, which we recognise as monogamous marriage, centred on the oikos or family home. And the Romans gave us that beautiful word matrimony, made up of two words, mater, meaning mother, monium, meaning state or condition. So matrimony is the institution built around the condition of motherhood. And mothers are built around babies for nine long months and beyond. And babies are built around 
the double helix of DNA. One strand from the mother, one strand from the father, intertwined, encoded into a new name that's never been spoken, modelled into a new face that resembles those two people who gave her existence. So that is matrimony, that is marriage and family, that is nature's masterpiece, and it can only be a man-woman thing. The second indictment, if you recall, was that same-sex marriage is an unnecessary proposition. Two figures to remember, 1% and 100%. The Australian Bureau of Statistics tell us 1% of couples in Australia are same-sex. The Australian Parliament tells us same-sex couples have 100% the exact same benefits, legal status as any other couple, <coughs> de facto or married. So where is this injustice, this inequality, that marriage equality is meant to address? Because in 2008, 85 laws were changed by a bipartisan majority of federal parliament to remove any discrimination against same-sex couples, whether in taxation, superannuation, DVA spouse status, next of kin status, whatever. As the Deputy Labor leader, Tanya Plibersek, confirmed in May last year, quote, we changed 85 laws at the time removed every piece of legal discrimination against gay men, lesbians and same-sex couples on the statute books, end quote. Every piece. In the eyes of the law, there is no difference between a same-sex couple and any other de facto or married couple. So in our country, same-sex couples have full relationship equality, but they can't have marriage <laughs> equality because their relationship is not a marriage as defined by nature. As one of the gay men in my book, Paddy Manning, says, quote, a same-sex relationship is different to a marriage because marriage is at its heart about children and providing those children with their biological parents. Recognising difference, says Paddy, is not discrimination, end quote. Just one more figure, 20%. According to Dutch statistics in 2013, that's 12 years after they brought in their same-sex marriage laws, only 20% of same-sex couples were married, while 80% of opposite-sex couples were married, even in Holland. So where is this great issue of injustice? If same-sex couples already have exactly the same legal status and benefits as any other couple, and the vast majority of them don't even want to marry, Now, far more impressive than the adult-centred arguments of equality is the child-centred argument for same-sex marriage. We'll hear again and again over the course of the plebiscite that we have a moral obligation to bring in same-sex marriage for two reasons. First, that it'll make children of same-sex couples feel normal and included. Second, that it'll make gay kids feel normal and included. I had a long debate with Mr Rodney Croom of Australian Marriage Equality on ABC Radio last year. And he made the first point this way. He said, children being raised by same-sex couples should have the affirmation, sense of security, sense of stability that comes with having married parents, end quote. Now, security and stability are valuable things. But children being raised by same-sex couples already have exactly the same legal uh, cultural stability and security. As any other household, where is the deficiency? Surely there's no intrinsic deficiency to a same-sex couple that leaves the children feeling unstable and insecure. Mr Croom would not propose that. So where is this discrimination? There's two other considerations on this question where we're told change marriage so kids in same-sex households can get that security. Well, first, a fair number of kids of same-sex households do not support same-sex marriage. Chapter two of my book is full of those examples, including Millie, who has graced us with her presence here later. Katie Faust, you would have seen on Lakeline last year, daughter of loving lesbian couple, 
And she said this, I recognise that while my mother was a fantastic mother, and most of what I do well as a mother I, I do because that's how she parented me, she can't be a father. Her partner, an incredible woman, both of, both of these women have my heart, cannot be a father either. Children have a right to be in relationship with their mother and father wherever possible. And as a society, says Katie, we should not normalise a family structure that requires children to miss out on one or both parents to be in that household, end quote. Heather Barwick also wrote last year, quote, my father's absence created a huge hole in me and I ached every day for a dad. I loved my mum's partner, but another mum could never have replaced the father I lost. Or Brandy Walton, who wrote last year, I yearned for the affection that my friends received from their dads. I wanted to know what it was like to be held and cherished by a man, what it was like to live with one from day to day. And as Katie Faust summed up, quote, we are just the tip of the iceberg of children currently being raised in gay households. When they come of age, many will wonder why the separation from one parent who desperately mattered to them was celebrated as a triumph of civil rights. End quote. The other cautionary consideration here is the finding of social science that we actually cause instability and insecurity when we break the biological bond between a child and his mother or his father. Same-sex parenting is just another way of breaking one or both of those bonds. So if we encourage same-sex parenting through instituting same-sex marriage, that destines more kids to suffer the emotional instability that comes with this new form of broken family. How is that a good move for children? Lots more on this in chapter four, Social Science Speaks Out. One more fascinating footnote. Contrary to popular opinion, even the opinion of former Prime Minister David Cameron of England, letting same-sex parents marry does not appear to improve children's well-being. Initial research by Sullins last year found a worsening of emotional problems for children in same-sex homes when the parents legally married. And that emotional uh, disadvantage and harm got worse the longer the marriage persisted. Now that's initial research, it's valid, it's statistically large and representative, but it teaches us not to naively assume that a marriage certificate will benefit kids in a same-sex household. And finally, that second child-centred argument for same-sex marriage is even more powerful. We must change marriage so that gay kids feel welcomed, normal and included. This was expressed powerfully by the former Irish president, Mary McAleese, the mother of a gay man, before the Irish referendum last year. And she said, quote, the only children affected by this referendum will be Ireland's gay children. We have to make it happen for them, who are relying on us to end the branding end the isolation, end the inequality once and for all, end quote. Now, we should be moved by that, and we all agree that we want to reduce emotional distress on young people. But this is the question. Is it proportionate? Does it make sense to overturn the foundational institution of society with all the on-flowing harms that that means? as a form of psychological therapy for some troubled kids. There are less radical ways to help. There are other ways to make them feel welcomed and included in our schools and clubs and churches. This argument, as you've observed, gets emotional to the point of blackmail. Give us marriage equality or you're making young people suicide. This same ultimatum and emotional arm twisting is being used to demand gay affirming sex education and overseas to demand laws for transgender surgery and transgender bathroom rights and so on. I deal with the fallacies of this emotional arm twisting in chapter six under the heading to combat depression, 
But it teaches us one thing. This all-purpose emotional ultimatum to comply with LGBT demands on marriage, sex education, transgender rights, and if you don't, you're culpable for gay depression or even suicide. It teaches us that legalising same-sex marriage is only one part of a package deal of demands. It's the most important means to the more ambitious end of normalising everything trans, bi and homosexual with the force of law. Indeed, after the Irish referendum was over, Mary McAleese confirmed the broader goal when she said, there is more to be done for the work of dismantling the entire architecture of homophobia is still not complete. The achievement of marriage equality surely and irrevocably propelled us further along the road." End quote. Now, dismantling the entire architecture of homophobia is another way of saying imposing the entire architecture of homophilia or coercing society to accept and affirm that entire spectrum of rainbow politics. So marriage equality does provide the legal clout to compel such acceptance, especially in the schools, and to silence any conscientious dissenters, especially in the churches. So if you vote yes at the plebiscite, if it ever happens, ladies and gentlemen, you will get so much more than mere marriage equality. You will get the full genderless package deal, whether you knew it or not and whether you like it or not. Now this, vote, this book votes no because fundamentally it puts the rights of the child ahead of the demands of homosexual adults. It says that our fellow citizens, our family, our friends are our equals in every way. They are free to live as they choose, but they are not free to choose a motherless or fatherless existence for future children. They are not free to impose radical LGBT sex education on all of our children. They're not free to silence pastors and conscientious objectors with that big stick of anti-discrimination law. And they're not free to so radically distort the natural truth of marriage, of parenting, of family, of mother and father, of husband and wife, and even of male and female, that future society and marriage will be unrecognisable. So for the sake of our families, of our freedoms, we must keep marriage true to nature as a man-woman thing. Now that's the excerpt, but that's only part of the introduction. So what I thought, what helped in other cities was a very, very quick ping, ping, ping through the chapter structure so you can get an idea of the skeleton of the book. I'll give you the first sentence only. There's four parts to the book. That was the indictment. Part one is the core, stealing a child's birthright. And chapter one is motherless children, fatherless homes. And it opens with the core statement. This is the heart of opposition to same-sex marriage. That it means same-sex parenting. And same-sex parenting means that future children must miss out on either their mother or their father. Chapter 2, children of homosexual homes speak out. If the central offence of marriage equality is that it deprives future children of their mother or father, then the central voice in this debate should be children who can tell us what that deprivation feels like. <coughs> Chapter 3, gay men speak out. And it opens... Some gay men go straight to the heart of opposition to gay marriage and make the case bravely and publicly, namely that marriage is not just about adult fulfilment, but about giving children a mother and father. And the institution of gay marriage makes that impossible. The last chapter in this section is social science speaks out and it opens this is a mountain of a chapter but it can be climbed in three manageable stages. How could I leave you with that? I won't leave you with that. I'll give you the little taste of the three stages. We first take the well-trodden path to base camp. The settled science established over decades of high-quality research that a child does best on average 
when raised by married biological parents. All family structures that fall short of this ideal that disrupt a child's kinship bonds, including divorced, blended, single parents, or same-sex parent structures, confer similar levels of disadvantage on a child. We conclude that any policy that deliberately deprives a child of a biological parent, such as same-sex marriage, is against the best interests of the child. The bulk of the climb takes us on a fascinating route to the no basis camp. Its full name is, there is no basis for the claim that children of same-sex parents show no difference in outcomes compared to children of married biological parents, end quote. Hence its abbreviated name used by the locals. On the way we pass by the frozen bodies of journalists, academics and activists who alas strayed from the path of intellectual integrity and led many simple people off the edge. At this point of the climb, many will have seen enough and be getting foot sore. By all means, head home, because you have covered the most significant terrain. You will be convinced how important it is for children to have that primal biological link to their mother and father. You will know how to correct any ill-informed person who says that kids in gay homes do just as well as other kids. The more experienced climbers might like to accompany me to the peak, where conditions are more cloudy and troubled. Part two, just a little one. LGBTQ sex education at your safe school. This is called stealing childhood. It opens gay marriage means gay sex education and parents will have no say. At present, parents can object to radical LGBT sex education programs like safe schools, and we can repel those who would impose indecent and disturbing material on our children. But once homosexual marriage is the law of the land, parents will have no grounds to push back. Vote for genderless marriage and you get safe schools on steroids. Chapter 6, Bullying, Blackmail and Born That Way, a large chapter full of reference. It says the three main arguments used to justify programs like safe schools are the same three arguments used to justify same-sex marriage. None of these arguments withstand scrutiny. Part 3, Repealing Nature, this goes deep into what happens when we enshrine a lie at the heart of our culture. The first chapter is mutations of marriage. Quote, we need to reject Senator Penny Wong's disingenuous words to the National Press Club last year that nothing will really change with same-sex marriage. Quote, the sun will still rise. Children will still eat more ice cream than is good for them, end quote. That is not what her fellow lesbian activist Masha Gessen told the Sydney Writers Festival in 2012 when she said, quote, Fighting for gay marriage generally involves lying about what we are going to do with marriage when we get there. Because we lie that marriage is not going to change. And that is a lie. Marriage is going to change, and it should change. And again, I don't think it should exist." End quote. The abolition of male and female, I think, is the core chapter of the whole book. I won't read you the first sentence. It's a mountain of a chapter dealing with that Gnostic mysticism of gender theory its origins, its consequences, and importantly, the clinical understanding of conditions like transgenderism and intersex, and how, therefore, to have the right compassion to such people who have those conditions without allowing the ideologues to misuse those conditions to smudge the very idea of male and female. I'll just give you the two quotes. The first quote is from The Gender Fairy, a storybook for Australian four-year-olds by Joe Hurst, with teacher notes by Ros Ward, quote, only you know whether you are a boy or a girl. Nobody can tell you. The second quote from Professor Paul McHugh, former director of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University, acknowledged as one of the leading psychiatrists of the last half century, and he says this, policymakers and the media are doing us no favours, either to the public or to the transgendered, by treating their confusions as a right to be defended rather than as a mental disorder that deserves understanding, treatment, 
and prevention, end quote. What you might call contrasting quotes. And final one in this section is the children of the state. What danger has Brendan O'Neill seen in marriage equality that others have missed? And how is it serious enough to make a libertarian lefty like him swim against the tide? Finally, part four, pillaging the village. Because we also steal from a child if we strip away her entire moral community, if we demonise her pastors, if we intimidate her parents or her teachers if they deviate from LGBT dogma. The first chapter is called The Silence of the Shepherds. Quote, they say it takes a village to raise a child. That means in order to raise tomorrow's child, according to the values of the LGBT revolution, it will be necessary to purge the village of reactionary moral leaders. That means faithful pastors, priests and rabbis. The final chapter is bigots, bakers and the thought police. This is the only chapter that's graced with a picture of the site of my medical surgery last year, courtesy of a local anarchist, and this, it opens how bracing it is to be on the wrong side of history. And finally, the settlement. Rather than the first line, let me give you the last passage of the close of this book. That society has given everything possible to our fellow citizens who are same-sex attracted, full equality under the law as individuals and as couples, affectionate treatment in the media and popular culture, genuine camaraderie in our workplaces and clubs, and exhortations in our churches that, quote, they must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity, end quote. We only ask that the generals of the gender movement do not usurp the one institution that is built around the child and her kinship needs that is founded on a truth of nature, not a fashion of ideology, that cannot be rendered gender neutral without violating the deepest moral and religious convictions of millions of their fellow citizens. It is not too late for more men and women who are same-sex attracted to stand up and say, not in my name, to this hostile deconstruction of marriage, this violation of a child's birthright, uh, this coercion of conscience. So what will be in the back of our minds on plebiscite day as we make our pencil mark? For me, it will always be the image of father, mother and baby. That timeless triple bond at the heart of human life. That is the real thing, the beautiful thing that is at stake in this debate. Defending that is the last ditch to die in. And in addition, my fighting spirit will rise at the thought of the genderless madness that will be imposed on our children and grandchildren under a regime of genderless marriage. Likewise, my defiance of the progressive elite who will use the legal power that comes to them with marriage equality to harass dissenters into silence. And no way will I have the words husband and wife demeaned as in other countries, to partner A and B just to meet the requirements of genderless couples. So at the front of our minds as we stand in that booth is the choice we cannot avoid. Will we give priority to children's rights or to homosexual adult claims? Faced with that choice, my hope and confidence is that Australians will stand with the child. Thank you. Thank you.